Um, but we're moving in, doing should with Tim and then letting us come in. Um, thank you, Steve. Is that like, I already um, asked you for what, ever since the words, I know you've been doing how many years It's several years, it's taken about three years to get you here, and you're only down the road, but uh, and you, we drink coffee in the same water in our so you all tell us exactly right. about you, but the, the Tadaka today is going to be collected in this beautiful pot made by Robin Stanley. He has more of the collection over there, and it's going to La Tete. So what we do is we give 10 shekels or as, more, as much more as you want to give. Um, you can, I'd rather actually just, I'll leave it over there, and you can give it afterwards. And thank you for everybody who contributed. Thank you, Yona, for, thank you, Yona, for the video. And uh, let's get started. Okay, so Eric um, talked to everybody. I'm Steve. Uh, and the, the, the relevant, I'm originally from England, I've been here for many, many years. Um, and I, the, 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 the reason that this setup is a strange setup physically <coughs> for me is that I come from the world of um, informal education as opposed to. So I, I do this sometimes, but I'm not looking to do. In other words, I'm looking to be as interactive as, uh, as possible as the world from which I come. So any of you who think you're just going to get a lecture tonight, I'm sorry. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to at least try and get you uh, involved. And that shouldn't be threatening, frankly, to, uh, to any of you. And <clears throat> so, as you know, <clears throat> the subject um, that, uh, that I want to talk about is uh, the story of the golem. But let me, before we actually get to the story, let me just put it within a certain um, framework. The subject, or the, it sounds pretentious, but the genre with which I want to work tonight is the genre of the folk story. You know, I understand a lot of people here are big text people, and you know, if you're big text people, so you know, it might be the Tanakh, and it might be the Talmud, and it might be the Midrash, and it might be all sorts of different things. Where you sit over a text and you, you know, you try and whack out some kind of meaning and understand who's been saying what about it uh, over the uh, years, and um, that's the way that classic texts often work. Folk stories work differently, because folk stories, there's always a, in a real folk story, there's a whole process of going through a million and one versions and gilgulim before you get to whatever appears on the printed page. You understand what I'm saying? Like someone wrote, I mean, I know, yes, you can say so in the Talmud as well, so there's hundreds of years of development, I accept that. But the specific bits, you know, the nuggets, if you like, um, are uh, from a specific <coughs> place and time. But in a folk story, it doesn't work like that. And this is folk stories all over the world. It doesn't work like that. What we have are things that develop partly orally, largely orally, and partly from a certain point in time. They get written down, but it's an evolving process which develops um, uh, constantly and continuously. So, um, I, so, so we're going to take the Golem as an example of a folk story which develops. Okay? <clears throat> and my fascination, not specifically with the Golem, but with this whole idea of folk stories, came many years ago when you know, I used to read, I think this goes back to my bar mitzvah, when I used to get you know, the so-and-so anthology of Jewish humor, or the so-and-so anthology of Jewish folklore, or whatever it was. And you read the stories, and what I never understood for many, many, many years is that in many cases, what I was seeing was only one stage in a continuing story. Because the way that most of us read text is that, indeed, we tend to see a piece of text and we tend to relate to it as it is, without thinking, actually, how it got to be, um, unless we're an extraordinary text expert, it got to be the way it, uh, it, it is when we see it. So when we get, all of you have seen, these books of, uh, you know, anthologies of folk stories or folklore or, you know, Jewish or not Jewish. Um, and I think what tends to happen is, you know, we tend to get to, let's say, number 113, which is the story of the princess and the pea or whatever, and you read it, and it's either entertaining or it isn't, and you go on to story 114. And what you don't do is stay with 113 and think it out. You understand what I mean? Because you tend to turn over the page and get to the next bit, because that's how many of us uh, tend to read. So, um, the Golem is, uh, is an example of a story which I want to suggest has a great deal of development uh, to it. And it's probably the most known, or certainly one of the most known, of Jewish uh, folk tales. So, let's start by seeing 
How many people, has anyone heard of the Garden of Prague? No? Has anyone not heard of the Garden of Prague? You're allowed to say no. Has anyone not heard? Okay, so can one of the people who, that's everybody who's heard of it, tell us what you remember of the story. What's the story that you remember? People were searching. Sorry. Okay, someone stop. The Mahalala Prague mm -hmm. uh, was um, fed up with Sikhs mm -hmm. uh, being beaten up. Mm -hmm. And he went down to the riverbank and mm -hmm. carved out a man. Mm -hmm. And he used Shem Hashem or whatever it was. And a man came out of the mud, mm -hmm. very reminiscent of uh, Adama Rishon. Okay. And his Talidim relates that he um, uh, made a man. That's terrific. Firstly, that's terrific. Thank you. What's your name? Linda. Linda. So that's terrific as a start. Anyone want, anyone remember anything else? Or anyone remember like any details of Linda? What did you say? Something with Emmet and Met. Something about Emmet and Met. Okay. That was the Do you remember what? Hold on. Do you remember what? Aleph was either missing or added to the word. Right. Something of this. Yes. Okay. There's an Emmet and Met. He wasn't very good at. He was. Not good at understanding his instructions and okay. could get them wrong. Well, go on. What could get? What's the well, particular instruction that you remember? Alive. Well, I remember something about where he was assigned to do some task right. and didn't realize that he needed to stop when it was done. Okay. Or if it was filling water. Or that's the source of friend. That's right. That's right. <laughs> no, no, no. But there's but something in that. It's a or you're correct. You're correct. Most things don't oh. almost understand us. <laughs> Not quite. Okay, hold on. So, is anyone is that familiar to anyone? Something about a task which went wrong? That's the source. And and the golem. What's the classic golem story of something that went wrong? Anyone know? No. Okay. Nobody remembers how the golem story finishes. You've got the you've got the beginning, the middle, and the near the end. But you haven't quite got the end. But I mean, inside a, a, a room, I remember when I was in the synagogue there that there was a room that was locked and he couldn't get out. And right, but why was he in that room? <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. Nobody. Okay. So, all right. So, fair enough. Whatever we've got. Is there any additional collective uh, wisdom, knowledge, wasn't memory there, in this room? Wasn't that room? for the community in Prague. Okay, but what was he doing in the room? That I don't remember. Uh, okay. Uh, that's right. why he was kind of sent up there. Because okay. he's like considered a main object, doesn't have an actual soul, doesn't have actual sechel. Okay. So it's kind All of right. a creation that has a very limited, very limited uh, scope of work, so to speak. Okay. All right. Um, and um, the whole point of this, as you said, is that the goal was, was Created, so to speak, to defend the Jewish community mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, it, is the, I don't. I've not been to the problem myself, but I understand that there are two statues there. Mm -hmm. the I, think, uh, I remember one. Right. Oh, there's two. There's one. Okay. okay. I remember saying. one big one. And um, the uh, the whole um, creation of the world was through a dream quest. What was the name of the It was from a dream quest. Through a dream quest. Red. Um, and that he was, uh, there was a oh, quote unquote answer in the street quest, and that's why he went ahead. Uh huh, okay, that's that great. Was what was that? I missed the last one. It was a dream quest. He had a dream. There was a question asked there. Special dream, dream quest, like right. a holistic means to get an right. answer what you, what you should do. Alright, that's terrific. We're moving along. Any extra bits and pieces? He's still you, can, you can add or you can subtract, by the way. You can add or you can subtract. So, modern Hebrew, uh, you tell the kids. Uh, it's, like, don't stand here like a golem. Like, don't stand here like a golem. Right. Like, many Israeli kids. That's, uh, that's the, the one piece of the golem story that they... Right, but they still use today. Don't stand here like a golem. Okay, great. They're still there. The golem is still there. The golem is still there. In the upper, upper room of the town hall of Prague. Town hall or synagogue? The synagogue. I was... Town hall? 
I was told at the town hall, I went there and they said this is where this the government is. Where the is. Uh, Can you the say naive the tourist? Town, the rat house. Okay. All right, Any, anything else we can squeeze? Well, I think uh, just to clarify on that idea of don't stand there like a golem. A golem in modern Hebrew is also a pupa. Is it? Um, I'm informed, you know, the metamorphosis of, right. a, of, a, of a caterpillar to a butterfly. Right. So a golem is, is the pupa. Absolutely. It's the stage. Right. So it's something that's incipient but not yet formed, right. which is an interesting idea. And also it comes from the word, uh, we also have Homer Golmi, which is raw material. <coughs> and so again, the Golem is, is, only, is, use, is only useful when the, when the shame is, or whatever it is, is in <coughs> place, sort of like batteries <coughs> not included kind of idea. Right. See, so, I put the batteries in. In which case... Well, the battery would be whatever that just whatever that pet is. Right, right, right. Um, so I think those are two just to add to the Terrific. piece there. Great. Anything, anything else? Okay. So, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start by looking at the beginning of the end of the process. I'm not talking about the beginning of the end of the golem, but the, which is a different thing, but at the beginning of the end of the folk process. And the beginning of the end of uh, any kind of folk tradition is when things start to get written down. I have, have a many, I've made about 20, so, you know, open them. Uh, oh. So, what I'm going to ask you to do, when you get this, I want you to turn straight, don't start at the beginning, I want you to turn to page a part five. It's source 12, part five. This is the Golem of Prague, the first version. It's on page seven, but somehow the seven is missing. So source 12, it says part five. Okay, has everyone got access? Okay, seventh page. Part 5, source 12. One question, uh, for Sure. Curiosity, I always had about the golem and I'm a big uh, sci fi fan. Go, go. Go. Um, I'm sure the mention has been made sometime of whether there was any kind of borrowing of the idea of borrowed golem as an actual kind of golem in the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. Right. So, the answer, so the, the answer is I don't know. Everyone has asked that question, and Tolkien is no longer around to, or he's not telling us. I mean, he's no longer around, and he hasn't told us. I, to the best of my knowledge, it's not known for sure. But it's certainly... Yeah, yeah, I know. I feel the same way. I feel the same way. These are my parents. They just brought me dinner. <laughs> they brought us dinner. The other story, by the way, just while we're waiting, the other story that no one's asked is, what's the relationship between, is there a relationship between the golem and Frankenstein? That's the obvious, that's the even more obvious question. That's the obvious question in terms of theme rather than just in terms of, uh, of uh, name, and there, the answer there is definitely yes. Okay? There is a connection, okay? And right at the end, uh, we'll uh, remind me and, and we'll bring it okay? So, when I say it's the beginning of the end of the story, it's, it's the beginning of the end of a folk tradition is really when a tradition is written down. Because for you know, thousands of years, it kind of, it's all up in the air, and maybe here and there it's touched text, but then someone puts it together, writes it down, and what I want to show you is from the mid-19th century, what is known as the very first version of the Golem of Prague story. And it comes from uh, a, it was 1847, it was a, uh, uh, a collector of folk tales um, uh, in the Jewish community, a man called Dr. Wiesel. And don't ask me whether he's got any connection with any other Wiesel, I don't know. This is Dr. Wiesel of Prague, 1847, who writes a whole series of stories down that he collected among the Jews of the ghetto of Prague. And this is one of them. And this is the first uh, uh, written story of the Golem of Prague. So, uh, guys, you're going to do the reading, as opposed to me and I'll fill in all the bits um, in between. So, is someone prepared to read number 12? During the reign of Rupert II, 
Rudolph II, who had opened on the Jews of Prague, was certain to sell a loan, who, on account of his tall structure and great learning, was called the Great Rabbi Lowe. Okay, just, just be uh, clear to everyone. Rabbi Lowe is indeed the uh, Maharal. Okay. This rabbi was well versed in all the arts and sciences, and especially in the Kabbalah. Thanks to this art, he was able to put life into figures from clay and wood and to make them perform whatever they were told to do, just as if they were real beings. Such, such self-created servants are worth a great deal. They neither eat nor drink, nor do they require any wages. They work patiently, when can scold them, and they do not answer back. Which I would, if we don't know anything else about Dr. Wiesel, but I think he had a servant problem, right? You know, we can, I think we can assume from that. Like a Rabbi Lowe fashioned such a servant out of clay, put into his mouth the shame, God's name, and thereby gave him life. This artificial servant did all the rough work in the house throughout the week. He chopped the wood, carried the water, swept the street, and so forth, but on the Sabbath he had to rest. Therefore his master, before the Shabbat began, removed the shame from his mouth and made him lifeless. It happened once that the rabbi forgot to do this, and the mischief was done. The magic servant went wild and pulled down houses, threw about lumps of rock, tore at trees by the roots, and played havoc in the streets. People ran to tell the rabbi. The situation was indeed awkward. The Shabbat had begun, and all work was prohibited. How was one to break the spell? Fortunately, in the Alpine Shul, the old synagogue, the Shabbat had not yet been sanctified, and as this was the oldest synagogue in Prague, everyone followed its guidance. There was still time to remove the shame from the master. <coughs> the rabbi ran to the golem and pulled the shame from its mouth. The lump of clay fell down and broke into pieces. The rabbi was greatly upset by this occurrence and was unwilling to create another such dangerous servant. It is said that even today, pieces of the golem can still be seen in the loft of the Alpine Shul. Okay, thank you. So that, and that's the whole story. That's the story as it appears. And there are a couple of interesting bits of these. Firstly, in what we've got here is the Al-Moshul, not the town hall. And I don't know any town. I'm not saying you're wrong, but traditions multiply. I don't know a town hall tradition. And there is a, you know, the usual place that's referred to is the attic of the Al-Moshul. So that's uh, one thing. Um, another thing, you've got the end of the Golem story here. What happens to him? What went wrong? What went wrong? It didn't stop it. It didn't stop it. It didn't stop it. And he, but what didn't he stop? In time? Like, what was the problem? Working on Shabbat. The problem was working on Shabbat, right? The problem was working on Shabbat, and, and then you get this extraordinary kind of crescendo of everything going crazy. Well, and the only way to undo that damage is to, or not undo the damage, but, um, but to, to, to take the batteries out of the golem is indeed to remove the Shen. Where was the Shen, by the way? His mouth, according to this. And the other strange thing about this is, like, what does the golem do in this story? He's just a servant. He's a servant. Like, you know, or all these stuff. I mean, you were the one who brought that up, right? Saving the community. Other people joined in. We remember saving the community doing this, that, and the other. No saving community here. It's the, I don't know, the, you know, the servant of the rabbi of the community or whatever. Oh, sorry, Kevin, like, did, you, did, you, did you mention the... The sorcerer's apprentice. Yeah, the answer is the eight round, right? Yeah, the as well. I don't know. That's the original Greek story, the big name. Sorry, it's the same. Go, go, go. Seems like we can allude. What happened here actually more to people of Israel without the Torah, because the real problem wasn't that. Shabbat started, the problem was the moment that Shabbat started, his master could no longer give him commands. And without receiving commands of what to do, that's when he went crazy. Until then, he was doing all the things he was told to do. Right, so he's an obedient servant. He's better than the servants in Prague at this time. Absolutely, but there's a problem with Shabbat. There's a definite problem. I just understood the problem of Shabbat. I understand why the God has to keep Shabbat, in fact, even now he's allowed to keep Shabbat. I can only show you the story. I can't even tell you the story. All I'm saying is this is the story that's written down. What exactly the lucky problem was, and this and that and the other, you know, whether a golem can be part of a minya, I mean, that's all very, that's all very interesting, but we're not going there tonight. Okay, so I really don't know exactly what the uh, lucky problem was here. Um, yeah. Is this the first reference? No, it's the first writ wet polo. It's the first, listen to very carefully what I say, because I'm going to come, because uh, we're going to undo this sentence in a minute. It's the first version, and the first written version of the Golem of Prague. Okay? Golem of Prague. Okay? And you'll see why that's significant um, a little bit later. 
So it's clear, and we will make it clear in a minute, that this, there's a lot of development <coughs> behind this. There's a lot of uh, all sorts of things that happen before it gets to this uh, final version. Uh, and the question is where you start. The question is like, you know, where would you start to look for this story? And I'm going to suggest a starting place. Because it's a starting place that before we get to the question of, uh, of uh, the actual question of Gollum, and certainly the actual question of Gollum Prague, um, I'm going to sim simply suggest a good starting place. And to me, the starting place has to come in the Breshit story. And so now go, we're going to go backwards. And um, bear with me. We're going to start. At, we're going to now start with the first source. And the first source is the the creation of uh, a human story, uh, with a very familiar text to all of us. Um, and uh, uh, and someone just to read that sentence. <coughs> and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The man became a living soul. Okay, so we've got this classic, this classic story of, uh, of the creation of, uh, of humanity, in which there is, of course, the spiritual and there's the material, and you need them both in order to create a person. Right? And this is, the, this is something which is familiar to all of us. Um, but I want to put, I'm not going to discuss it, but I just want to put that out there as what I think is the thing that lies right at the beginning of the development process. You've got the material, and the spiritual, you've got the dust and the breath, and you need them both in order to create a, uh, a being. Right? When God creates, that's how God creates. And this is the story that we've been, uh, that has come down to us, and that we have been um, telling ourselves about how a person is created for thousands of years. Now, I want to go to, uh, from there, to a piece from the uh, Talmud. This is the, this is the Bubbly. Everything in the, from the Talmud is from the Bubbly. Today. Um, and it's a, <clears throat> it's a piece from Masechet uh, Sanhedrin um, about the creation, a, a more detailed version of the creation story. It's a midrash, uh, a midrash on a, 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 um, a, a phrase or a sentence from, uh, from Tehillim. And, uh, and, and this is the story uh, that Acha um, Bar Chanina. Uh, tells. Okay, so if someone is willing, the story of creation of a person um, through Acha Bar Hanina. Acha Bar Hanina said, the day and twelve hours. In the first hour, the earth was piled up. In the second, he became a golem, a still unformed mass. Okay, just hold it for a second. This goes back to what was said before. The golem is a word with, uh, with meaning. Um, exactly as was said, it's, it's raw and unformed. Right? From a gelem, uh, a, a golem of a, a butterfly, all of those things, it's a raw, unformed something. Something before the something that will come out of it is formed. In the third, his limbs were stretched out. In the fourth, the soul was cast into him. In the fifth, he stood on his feet. In the sixth, he gave all living things names. In the seventh, Eve was given to him for a companion. In the eighth, the two lay down in bed, and when they left it, they were four. In the ninth, the prohibition was communicated to him. In the tenth, he transgressed it. In the eleventh, he was judged. In the twelfth, he was expelled and went out of paradise. As, as it is written in Psalm 49, 13, and Adam does not remain one night in glory. Thank you. Now one of the, one of the uh, uh, things, we're, we're bringing a number of different midrashim from different places, from different places. We're not going to examine the, um, the inner um, um, construction or the inner workings of the midrash. I'm taking the midrash in its finished form without working out what exactly, what caused Achar Bar Hanina, for example, to, you know, what situation might have brought him to create this kind of a midrash. Um, but I just want to make the point that once a midrash is there, it doesn't matter whether it's passed down orally or it's uh, written, um, it's there. And those midrashim that are remembered then become part of the collective uh, memory. And uh, what we see is slowly we're going to accumulate a number of uh, 
uh, of different associations, um, which will feed into uh, the Golem story. All right. All we've done here is we brought a um, uh, a midrash from uh, uh, from the second Sunday. <clears throat> and the reason I brought it is because it uses the word Golem. Because it uses the word uh, Golem and to uh, underline the fact that Golem is something with a uh, meaning. Okay. Now I'm going to jump though. I want to jump to number three. Um, and we have uh, a, uh, a medieval work called Midrash al Kir, if I remember correctly, it's from Spain. Um, something like the 11th, 12th century. And uh, we have another uh, midrash mm. that, uh, that appears on a related subject. But as you'll see, it's also very good. Number three. Somebody wants to go in there? Rabbi, Rabbi Barak has said, When God wished to create the world, he began his creation with nothing other than man and made him as a golem. When he prepared to cast a soul into him, he said, if I set him down now, it will be said that he was my companion in the work of creation. So I will leave him as a golem in a crude, unfinished state until I have created everything else. When he had created everything, the angel said to him, Aren't you going to make the world which spoke of? He replied, I made him long ago, and the soul is missing. Then he cast the soul into him and set him down and concentrated the whole world in him. With him he began, with him he concluded. As it is written, um, Psalm 1395, you have formed me before and behind. Okay, great. So, so let's stay there for a second. So we have it's another Midrash, hundreds of years later, also from the, based on a, um, a, a verse in Tehillim. And uh, what's the, the story that takes place in this Midrash? What happens? What's the plot? What's the, what's the plot? I mean, this isn't a trick question, it's what happens. You know, what, what actually happens in this? Right, the goof is made before the Neshama. Right, the goof is made before the Neshama. The goof is made near the beginning of the creation story. And then there's a waiting period. And then everything else is made. And then the Neshama, the neshama, the neshama is, uh, is added. Why? To explain the verse. No. So uh, no, 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 What's the, what's the, why is the neshama added to, according to the story? The story explains the verse, but in the story, why is the neshama added? So they wouldn't say that he helped God create the world. Exactly, because there's a theological danger, right? If God, man is the man, man, uh, you know, those, um, if man is the pinnacle or the, you know, the highest point of the creation process, and man is made, and then everything else is made, there is a theological danger from the point of view of this story, of this Midrash, that what will man do? Be equal to God. Well, will... Or people will not, think he is. I, or, or, or either people will think he is, or he will think he is. Right, I don't think the suggestion is that he will be equal to God, but there, there might be a claim that he's equal to God. God and man created all of the rest of the things. Okay, God created man, and then God and man created all the rest of the things, which is something which, according to this Midrash, there's a theological danger there, which is man's arrogance, potential arrogance. And in order to avoid that, so the creation story of man is split into two. You do the first part, then you create everything else, and just to make sure that man doesn't become too uppity, you, you add that, you, you do the, the end of the baking process at the end. Okay, so... Um, Does it also say that we're all, that we're all basically golems as well, perhaps, for that song? Go on, why? Because you know, we're all basically just raw materials. It's only when you know, the Shema is breathed into us. Right. We become more than we Yeah, well, yes, 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 yeah. You mean before the, the idea before the Shema is yeah. put in, we're going to, yeah, in a sense, yes. Right. I'm not sure what the need is to split the creation of man. It's not in the text, except for the text of the song. It, why, why split it? Why not just leave the creation of man at the end in two parts? Uh, uh, all I can say it? is, all I can say is, it's a, it's a, it, it's a kind of, um, it's a non-midrashic question. 
that you're asking? Because no, the, because Midrash usually answers a question in the text, and I don't understand what this Midrash is coming to address in the well, text. Well, we can story. So, I think I can jump in. The question okay, in the text is no more than an excuse to say whatever they want to say. No, it's I, not a real question in the, the text. Question in the real text is the proof of let us make human beings. That proof Possibly. was a problem from, from many children. Right, so the whole question of who was it, the angels, the animals, this, that, and the other. It's true that it comes so up in there, possibly, possibly, yeah. possibly. But once again, I'm looking at it from a literary point of view, as opposed to a theological point of view. I just want to say that someone in the Middle Ages thought, it was a pro thought there was a problem here, and therefore has this story with a point saying man is potentially arrogant, and therefore the creation process of man needed to be split in two. Right, and maybe it was hung on to a verse, and maybe there's a thing in the verse and in the text which caused someone to create that. I don't want to, once again, I don't want to get into that. I don't want to do an internal, okay. uh, internal uh, analysis of either the halakhic process or the midrashic process, just to look at when these texts come from and how they come into the story. So here we've got something, we haven't just got the idea of a golem, as man as a golem, in the creation process, but we've got the idea of the separation of uh, the two parts of the process because of the theological danger. There's, a, there's something potentially problematic about the creation of man. That's all I think at this point, at least, we need to, um, we need to say. And whoever it was who wrote Midrash of Kir, which is not known, um, they were aware of that. And it's going to be significant uh, in a few minutes' time. Um, so I want to keep that in mind. The arrogance of man can still be expressed in that method, because by leaving man as his final creation, that was the peak of the creation. So man could still... Listen, I think that man has for thousands of years been claiming, you know, the privileged place that yeah, he has, <laughs> because, right, because we were the, we were the crown of creation, etc., etc., etc. Absolutely. I would extend that. I'm sure that's correct. But I think that, that here there's an attempt saying, you know, it would be even more problematic if man was yeah, at the, if he were the beginning the of the process. Now, let's leave the creation of, uh, of man by uh, God, the, the story that we know and the uh, versions of it, and let's go on to part two, which I call the creation of man by man. Okay, let's go on to actually human creation stories, of which we have a number. I'm going to start with, um, with a, a, a piece, of story from Masechet uh, uh, Sanhedrin, which tells about Rava, the Rava, the great uh, uh, Babylonian uh, rabbinic leader. So, um, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to put a couple of bits and pieces in in the middle. Somebody used to start with number four. Rava said, "If the righteous wished, they could create a world. For it is written, Isaiah 59:2, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. The implication is that if a man is simply without sins." His creative power is no longer separated from that of God. And the text continues as though its author wished to demonstrate this creative power. For Rabbah created a man and sent him to Rabbi Zeh. Uh, it's really Zeh. Um, the, uh, just before you continue, um, two points. Firstly, Rabbah is known... Firstly, firstly, before anything else, what's the idea? What stops man, according to this, being creative? Sin. Sin, right? If we, if you're, so, you know, we can't create because we have uh, so many sins. So the implication is, if we didn't have so many sins, we would be able to create. And then we have a story about rubber, and rubber is known as a very, very saintly, uh, you know, sort of a wonderful uh, uh, a leader, kind of a, basically the equivalent of the sinless man or the nearest you have. And so, so here, quite naturally, whoever put the uh, Gemara together brought they brought this idea this quote from Rava, and then they tell a story about the sinless Rava, where they bring it together and it becomes one quote. So, uh, uh, so for, uh, the second thing to say is, Rava created a man sent to Rabbi Zer, and there are lots of stories about Rava and his companion Rabbi Zer in the, uh, in the Talmud. Lots and lots of stories. They're kind of a, a you know, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry thing of the, you know, they do things together. They do things together, lots and lots of stories. And this is a story. The rabbi created a man and sent him to Rabbi Zera, and let's see what happens. The rabbi spoke to him and he did not answer. Then he said, you must have been made by the companions, members of the Talmudic Academy. 
Return to your dust. Okay. Anyone, do you get what's the, what, like, what is, what is Rabbi Zera's problem? We don't know exactly what causes him to realize there's a problem, but what's his problem? What does he realize? It's not a human, it's not a, it's not a, no, what did you say? It's not a wife? <laughs> maybe, maybe. But, there's, but, but the thing is, there's something in this thing that uh, the rabbi spoke to him and he doesn't answer. We don't, know, we don't know from the story why he doesn't answer, but we just know he doesn't answer. And that tweaks Rabbi Zera. He says something is wrong with this picture. You are not a real God-made man. You are some kind of a man-made man or an artificial man or something. You know, not, we're not dealing with you. You go back and turn yourself back to dust, which is where you, uh, which is where you belong. Uh, the companions mean, this here means the uh, like the uh, the rabbinic assembly, not the rabbinic assembly of today, but the rabbinic assembly of of then, right? You know, you must have been made. You've been made by some. You know, rabbis have been making you, and they're not meant to. This is very. You know, this is not. Uh, this is not correct. Back you go to dust, right? I'm not accepting you. I'm, I'm drawing the line and saying there's something wrong with this picture. Um, uh, go back to dust. Um, now we're jumping, I'm jumping around a thousand years because around a thousand years later, uh, among many other scholarly things that he did, the Maral of Prague, who we know because we associate him with the Golem story later, right? Um, the Maral of Prague. Um, comments on this verse. He comments on this verse. He writes a, a commentary to uh, to the Talmud, and he gets to this particular piece in Masechet Sanhedrin, and he ha he writes the following thing. This is part of his commentary, um, and he's trying to explain that why what Rabbi Zeira's problem was. What he was. What what does it mean? You know, the the, the man didn't answer. Why was that a problem? Okay, so this is. Uh, this is uh, the Mara, 16th century, 16th, 17th century. Somebody? When he, Rafa, would purify himself and meditate over the Sefer Yitzira, concentrating intensively on the different names of God, he would thereby connect very closely with God and be able at such moments to create a person. But this person would have no power of speech or potential for this. For that, Far was Rava's energy not able to extend itself, that he would be capable of creating a speaking human being like himself. For he, Rava, was a human being himself, and how would it then be possible for him to create a complete person just like himself? Just as it is impossible to conceive that God, who is supreme over everything, would create one like himself. Okay, so that's, a, that's an interesting idea. So the idea is that everything that has creative power can, everything that has creative power can create one step down. Right? You can always create like one step down from, from what you are, but you can't create yourself. So God can create everything apart from God. And people who are sinless and with creative power can create everything apart from everything down one degree from themselves. So, um, so uh, you can create, for example, you can create a human being, suggests the morale, but... No power of speech. Right, no power of speech. It has thing. to have a faculty missing. Yeah. You can't create a human being just like you. Even if you're the most saintly person in the world, which gives you creative power, you can't create a human being like yourself. It has to have something like it. So here's the explanation, is that the, the, the fact that the, the, God, the, the man didn't answer um, was what uh, was the clue for Rabbi Zahira that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that, it's, you know, that it hasn't got all the faculties and it must be made by uh, a very saintly person, but not by God. So that's the idea. Now the fact is we've run ahead of our story. I just wanted, I couldn't resist that, um, that story from uh, Amaral. But, so I'm going backwards now. Right. In other words, in time, that's the 16th century, 16th to 17th century, and the uh, uh, and we've come from the Talmud to the 16th, 17th, 17th century. Now we're going back to another medieval midrash. And just before this, I want to mention uh, something that appears in the uh, in the Amaral's uh, uh, commentary, which we haven't mentioned. The Sefer Yitzira. What is the Sefer Yitzira? Yeah. Yeah. 
Kabbalistic word. Sorry? It's a Kabbalistic word. It's a Kabbalistic word. It's, it's seen to be... Sorry? It's mystical pre-Kabbalah. Right, right. It's Mitnachon. In Kabbalah, in the, ge in the general sense, <coughs> it's early Kabbalah. Kabbalah, when you were being very specific in the medieval sense, the Kabbalah meaning the thing that was mystic. called the Kabbalah, as opposed to the general mystic tradition, um, it's, an early, uh, it's an early work. So it's a very early mystical work, and some people believe it. Goes right back to the um, second, and third century, uh, certainly the fourth and fifth century, which makes it um, extremely early in terms of uh, Jewish mysticism, or in general terms, the Kabbalah. Um, the tradition is, by the way, does anyone know who the tradition? Abraham. That's right. So the tradition is that it was written by Abraham, um, and that there, you know, and you know. You that tradition, whatever you want to do with that tradition, but the Sefer Yitzirah is certainly an early work. And what's it about? Sefer Yitzirah is about creation. It's about creation, and it's kind of in a, in, in a um, uh, gives clue to, to using the letters of the alphabet in certain specific groupings and um, how God came to create uh, the world. It's something about it's seen as the clue to the creation process that God used when God made the world. I think I hope I'm not doing it. Uh, uh, injustice when I say that. But I think, that, so the Sefer Yitzhak, the book of creation, um, the earliest kind of God creates the world book um, text is, uh, has been uh, mentioned by the Maral of Prague when he talks um, about creating, uh, uh, Robert's creation of man. But he's not the first to use it because now we're going backwards to an earlier text, in fact a series of earlier texts, which mention Sefer Yitzhak. And we now come to a 12th century Midrash, which, which mentions, uh, um, uh, which mentions uh, Sefer Yitzhak. Uh, hold on. We're going to play a game, just before we read this. We're going to play a game. Um, and you'll understand why we're going to play a game. It's a very serious game. Now, uh, what we're going to do, you stay where you are. And what we're going to do, I think we'll simply use this front row, because you're not in a circle, and so I gave you the chance of moving forward you didn't take it. So I think people are going to play the game from the front row. And it's a game you all know. It's what the British call... Uh, remember now. The British call a lot of Chinese whispers, right? And the Americans call Delta. Where are you going? So... Oh, what are you going? <laughs> 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 so... You broke a broken telephone? Okay, so, so all sorts of different traditions here. So it's Chinese whisper of the telephone, broken telephone. And what you, you're going to, you're going to start, okay? And what you're going to do, you know how it works. You're going to, do you know, you know again? You're going to think of a phrase or a small sentence, six, seven, eight words, no more than that. And you are going to pass it over to Sue. And then Sue is going to pass it over to Morris. Morris, and Morris is going to pass it over to Warren. Warren is going to pass it over to Sue. Etc. Etc. Now the only thing that is going to be a little different from your conventional Chinese whispers is I'm going to interfere with the process. All right? What I promise is I don't touch anybody, but I will interfere. Okay? And you will do your best to get this message round. This is English. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, I'll give you a chance. <laughs> Go back to yeah, right. you. Got that? You got that? You got that? 
So you were there? 99 bottles on the wall. 99 bottles on the wall? I said 99 bottles of beer on the wall. 99 bottles of beer. Okay, so that, hold on, hold on. So where, hold on, hold on. So, so it was the front, we got beer. Now, let, let's think what happened. Beer gets dropped out of the process somewhere, right? We get 99 bottles. Uh, did we have a wall with you? We had a wall and we had a wall with you already. So more or less, it's uninterrupted. Apart from the fact that the beer has fallen out until we get to you. You had the 99 bottles and something happened to you. And then you got to? I went to Canyon Mafa. Okay, no, but you went to? I battled the stream with water. You got the stream on the string and the water, but you got the battles. The battles. The battles. Battles string. Okay. Now, now why, why do we do this juvenile game, and what's this got to do with our subject? Um, I want to suggest to you the following thing, this is serious, this is now a serious point, we will uh, retain our gravity first. Oh, guess it. There was some kind of story that was taken down before it touched on the dad and was Why do stories change? Why do stories change? Partly because they told orally, that's certainly yeah. true. Sometimes things have happened to us the way we perceive things, and so we tell the story differently as a result. Okay, sometimes we tell, we perceive things differently and we tell a story. That's all very, you're doing very well, but you're very... Or embellish things, or we add, okay. But there's something else that happens. Think, think what might, because we could have done, I could have made that point easily, guys. There's influences from outside that sometimes change the story. Absolutely. What sort of influences? Think real. Don't think of me, but think real. World events. What? World events. World events. Disasters, wars, for the Jews, you know, this destruction, that destruction, people going from here to there. And what happens, and the, stories are changed. And the language can also change. The language changes, the story changes, elements are added, elements are forgotten. There's tremendous distortion. And that's what happens, forget Jews, that's what happens everywhere with folk uh, traditions. But if you have a dislocated history, like the Jews tend to do it from so many uh, uh, periods, where it wasn't just something was passed down, even when things are passed down peacefully from one place to another through, you know, 30 generations, 50 generations, you're going to get enormous uh, change for the reasons that were said. But if you've got external dislocation, uh, meaning something that comes and stops the tradition being passed down calmly and peacefully, then you're going to get distortion and sometimes very strong distortion. And, and why I did that then is, is in advance of the story that we're going to have a look at uh, now. Uh, we now get to... Uh, I, if I scared anyone off, I apologise. Right? If I was abusive to anyone, I apologise as well. Um, but uh, let, now we're going to go to... Um, now we're going to go to number six, and we're in the, uh, this is another midrash from the 12th uh, century, I don't remember where from, um, and uh, we'll just let the story talk for itself. Someone watch it, come in. When God created his word, he first created the Sefer Yetzirah and looked into it, and from, he, and from it created his word. Which is rather interesting, it's a great line. It's like, God first created the recipe book, and read the recipe book, and made the recipe, which is just interesting. Okay. When he had completed his work, he put it into the Torah and showed it to a man who, however, understood nothing. Then a heavenly voice went forth and said, Are you really trying to compare your knowledge with mine? Why? You cannot understand anything in it by yourself. Then he went to Eber and went to Shem, his teacher, they meditated on it for three years until they knew how to create the world. So likewise, Rava and Rabbi Zera buzzed themselves with the Sefer Yetzirah, and a cup was created to them, which they slaughtered. And Yermia uh, and Ben Zera also busied themselves with it for three years, and the man was created. Okay, so what's interesting, thank you, what's interesting about this is that this, this medieval text has brought together, has clearly brought together a number of traditions about people creating, starts with God creating the world, and then Sefi Yitzhima plays a key role, and then they, we've got a number of stories of people who were involved in creation <coughs> stories, which have been uh, uh, brought together. And the reason, the, the, the first reason that I like it so much is because 
What's happened to Rav to Rabbi and Rabbi Zera? They're just one of many. Well, firstly, they're just one of many. That's true. But what's happened to their story? They were working together. They were doing it together. And what did they make? It was a cat. It was a cat, not a man. Right. So, so it's really, and to me, my suggestion, only a suggestion, is that's, the, that's what we're talking about in folk traditions. Like, somehow, there was a tradition that Rava and, uh, and Rabbi Zeira created, uh, uh, were involved in some kind of creation story, um, except by the time it got here, um, it wasn't Rava and it wasn't Rava doing it and Rava and Zera uh, negating it. They were doing it together. It wasn't a man, it was a calf. So somewhere there was a faint memory, I strongly suspect, that there was a Rava and Rava Zera uh, creation story involving something, something animate that they've made. But it wasn't, you know, in some way or another, it got mixed up. In the, uh, it's interesting, gets mixed up. In, uh, once again, in the Talmud, there is a story of Rabbi Hanina and Rabbi Hoshaya who create the calf. That's there in the Talmud. And, uh, and maybe they got it mixed up and you know, they didn't have the Talmud there. And so, so kind of all these traditions get a little bit mixed up. And of course, when traditions get mixed up, it's, rather, it's from the literary point of view, it's great. Because it means more and more things are coming in. More and more ingredients are being added to the stew and it just makes for a richer process. The last, um, the last pair that I mentioned here, you know, you've got a series of pairs of people. It's, uh, it's uh, um, Eber and Shem, and then it's Rabbi and Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Zera, uh, and then it's uh, Jeremiah and Ben Sira. So, um, now, Jer there are a whole series of stories about Jeremiah and Ben Sira. Who's Ben Sira? Ben Sira was indeed a, some people know the book of Ben Sira, which is a, uh, uh, a late second uh, temple uh, work, work of wisdom, really. Um, uh, but there's, and though I don't know whether it's because of the name or not, but there's a whole series of traditions from the rabbinic period about Jeremiah and Ben Sira. Now, one of the things we hear in, 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 in the book of Jeremiah is that Jeremiah didn't have a family, didn't have, uh, didn't have anyone, didn't have children. Um, but but it, so someone at some point creates a tradition that there's between Jeremiah and Ben Sira, and someone else understands it as Jeremiah and his son Sira. In other words, you understand what I'm saying? Like Ben Sira in some traditions becomes the son, i.e., of Jeremiah, Sira. Okay? So now we've got this tradition, we don't know where it came from, but it's there by the 12th century. The Jeremiah and Ben Sira, who might be Ben Sira, who might be his son Sira, are, uh, are playing around also with, uh, with the creation thing, and, uh, uh, and we've got that. And I want to go now to the, um, to, we're a little bit later, about 100 years later, in the 13th century, when we have a full-blown um, uh, story about Jeremiah and Sira, okay, uh, creating, right? So this is a little bit after that Midrash. We don't know whether it's been a linear process or not. All we know is by the 13th century, several generations after the previous text, we have a full-blown uh, uh, full tradition in writing which connect Jeremiah, Sira, and the creation of a person. And, uh, and it's a great story, and uh, we should listen to it very carefully. Number seven. The prophet Jeremiah <coughs> sorry, uh, busied himself alone with the sacred Yitzhirah. <coughs> then a heavenly voice went forth and said, Take a companion. He went to his son Sirah, <coughs> Sira, and they studied the book for three years. Afterward, they set about combining the alphabet in accordance with the Kabbalistic principles of combination, grouping, and word formation. And a man was created to them. On whose forehead stood the letters But this newly created man had a knife in his hand, with which he erased the Allah from the Emet. There remained Met, dead. Then Jeremiah tore his clothes because of the blasphemy. God is dead now. Elohim Elohim Met. Right. God is dead now implied in the inscription and said, why have you erased the Aleph from Emet? Okay, just before we get to the explanation, just want to make sure that everyone's on the same page and understanding the story. The so Jeremiah and the Sira, what do they do? They create a man. They create a man and... He can speak. 
and right and he can speak. This is a speaking man. That's true. It's a right. It's a totally Absolutely. Right. All of these ingredients are going, and you'll see they bubble under, they and they come up again, and then they vanish, and then they come up again in different guises. So this man can speak, and this man is born with what? What's what's uh, what's on his forehead? Like a tattoo. All the letters. Right, like a right. The, the, we've got Elohim, uh, uh, Elohim Emet, or like a tattoo on his forehead. Like a coin to Like a baby. But 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 he he's also born with a knife in his hand. And what does he do with a knife? Rather is Allah, so it says God is dead, although he met. And then uh, Jeremiah and uh, is very, presumably Sarah too, very, very upset because of this terrible blasphemy. And now he says, well, why did you do that? What on earth did you do? And now we get the man, the created man's answer. He replied, I will tell you a parable. An architect built many houses, cities, and squares, but no one could copy his art and compete with him in knowledge and skill, until two men persuaded him. And then he taught them the secret of his art, until they knew how to do everything in the right way. When they had learned his secret and his abilities, they began to anger him with words. <clears throat> Finally, they broke with him and became architects like him, except that what he charged a sailor a large amount of money for, they did for six groats, a very small sum. When people noticed this, they ceased to honor the artist and came to them and honored them and gave them commissions when they required to have something built. Okay, hold it there. Don't look any further. What's the message? What do you think the message is? The original? Make sure you got good trade union law. Okay. Why is the man, in other words, the created man, telling Jeremiah this story? He's saying, I'm not blaspheming, you are. I'm not blaspheming, you are. What are you doing in your blasphemy? You're, you're copying God. You're copying God. That's the blasphemy, right. Now, you got it? In other words, right, it's like, it's like there's God, who's the architect, and there's people doing the cheap reproductions. And, uh, and, uh, and you know, you're making you, Jeremiah, are trying to, you know, your mum, you know, you know you're, you're doing all sorts of things with uh, practical Kabbalah, and you're making uh, you're making a man a cheap version of God's creation, and uh, and there is a danger. And let's continue the last bit, and you and the danger will be clear. So God has made you in His image and in His shape and form. But now that you have created a man like Him, people will say there is no God in the world besides these two. Now, just before we continue, what does that sound like that we've heard already? What have, we, what have we heard which is a little bit like that? No, no that's so. where the man the at the beginning. Right, right, right. Do you remember that, that oh, story about yeah. separation of the, of the material part of creation of man yeah. and the spiritual part? Because there was the danger that man would arrogate to himself, you know, the claim that he can make, he can create. So this is, I would suggest, the second, the second example that we have at least here, the second that I've come across when you get a theological warning. You get a theological warning that it is not just wrong to meddle around with, you know, um, with, the, with creation, but it's dangerous because it can cause um, a situation in which people will forget God and think that humans have all the power that God has. Now that's an extraordinary thing, because God is dead, of course, goes, sounds to us a little bit like Nietzsche, and uh, this is like 19th century, people are forgetting, forgetting God, or leaving God, etc., 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 and uh, are claiming that, you know, we understand science, we understand everything, and we can reproduce, uh, you know, whatever happens, we, just, we can have control of the is this, do you know if this uh, Midrash comes from the Christian or the Muslim world? I don't remember. Oh, just because there's it's a good no, question. There is no God recalls the, you know, the Muslim Warren, I don't know. I, I just don't remember. It's too long since I've done it. Um, but it's a fact, you know, it's fascinating that this, here we have, um, in this creation of man story, it's the second time we've got a theological warning. There's a danger in man creating, mankind creating uh, man. Even if you've got no sins, and even if you're perfect in every other way, you shouldn't do it, says this text, and says the earlier text, 
because it is theologically dangerous. Uh, people will forget God. Uh, people will um, uh, will claim that uh, man, people people will claim that they have the creative abilities that people have pre the other people have previously attributed to God. And without getting into the theological question, because each of us will believe what we what we believe. But I think it's extraordinary. This is basically a warning of what would happen five, six hundred years later when we get to the Enlightenment, the beginning of secularism, etc., etc., where, where, and when we're only in the 13th century. But around this golem, around this, sorry, this man-making man text, we have a warning, which indeed will be a deep theological and philosophical warning which will really be relevant hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of years later when people start to forget God or claim that man uh, um, that the man really does uh, uh, no magic create. And once again, I'm not getting the theology of where each of us stands, but from the point of someone in the Middle Ages standing within the Jewish tradition, um, uh, uh, with of course the complete and utter 100% uh, conclusion um, that knowledge, that uh, God is the creative force and the only creative force, then the idea that God could be forgotten and that people will arrogate to themselves creative power is a terrifying uh, thought and it's a major warning that has to be sounded. But then this also go against the opinion we saw before that each, per each someone can only create something which is lower than him because they create um, something which is almost equal that can talk. No, that's right. Yeah. The answer is yes. And it's like it's the same thing as you know you don't look for consistency necessarily between one one midrash and the other. Yes, yeah. What you what we have here actually right in folk traditions you have different things spinning in and spinning out, spinning in and spinning out. You know we said that right this man can talk, but we already heard he was silent because folk um, folk culture doesn't develop in a linear form. An element appears, disappears, reappears, and we're going to see that. And we'll see you know we're going to see it in, in a couple of minutes. I just don't understand the difference between what God does. So God has made you in his image, in his shape and form. But now that you have created a man like him, meaning like God. No, like, 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 yeah, now God. you have done, I think it means, now you have done God. what God did. Like God, created, 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 right, created exactly. Man. Like God, you've created a, a person. But God made a man like himself. No. 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 Right. Well, that's also true. Right. God created a man in his image. Well, that's straight from the okay. that's straight from the Torah. But that's, what is the distinction? But now that you have created a man like him, like God created, created like not like him. Ah, yeah. like okay. right. right. like he did. Yes. Yeah. yes. Ah. Got it. Okay. Let's move. Uh, let's move on. Um, something else that happens in the Middle Ages is we start to get a lot of people dabbling in, um, in practical Kabbalah. And one of the, um, uh, uh, one of the, especially in Central Europe, one of the um, focal points of much of this uh, discussion uh, is around the Sefer Yitzirah. Sefer Yitzirah becomes a very popular uh, text in uh, mystical circles, and there's lots and lots of people uh, studying Sefer Yitzirah. And among other things, we get commentaries to the Sefer Yitzhak. And among other things, in those commentaries, we get basically recipes for how to make a man. Right? Because the whole question of, of making a man, or making creation, is there in Sefer Yitzhak. So some of the people that are commenting on the Sefer Yitzhak, among other things, talk about how to make a person. <coughs> we didn't finish that one. Oh, I'm sorry. We are so you're right. Where, who was reading? Yeah. Yeah. Please, please, please. Sorry. Give it. Thank you so much. Give us the end of it. Okay, then Jeremiah said, what solution is there? He said, write the, alpha, the, the same, sorry, write the alphabets backward on the earth you have strewn with intense concentration, only do not meditate in the sense of building up, but the other way around. <clears throat> so they did, and the man became dust and ashes before their eyes. Then Jeremiah said, truly one should study these things only in order to know the power and, and omnipotence Omnipotent. Thank you. Of the creator of this world, but not in order really to <clears throat> practice them. Okay, so we let's know the, the theory, but let's not do it in practice. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's Jeremiah in his stories, his conclusion, having heard, you know, I've done the wrong thing, I completely understand, fine knowledge is one thing, but actually putting it into practice is something else. We can do the one, but we can't do the other. Okay. <coughs> So let's go back to, I mean, forward to the uh, to the to two pieces 
um, from uh, different commentaries on the Sephiotila, somewhere around 1200. We'll just read them without, I was going to say without commentary, I don't mean that. We'll just read them without any extra bits and pieces, just one after the other. Somebody, number eight. He who consults the Sephiotila must first take a cleansing bath and put on white garments. He then takes virgin soil from a mountain which has not been dug by men, soaks it in well water, and then makes the golem, forming each limb by reciting alphabetic permutations. Thank you. And then another version from the same time, number nine. Then take a bowl full of pure water and a small spoon, fill it with earth, but he must know the exact weight of the earth before he stirs it, and also the exact measurement of the spoon which he is to measure. When he has filled it, he should scatter it and slowly blow it over the water. While beginning to blow the first spoonful of earth, he should utter a consonant of the name of God in a loud voice and pronounce it in a single breath until he can blow no longer. While he is doing this, his face should be turned downward. And so, beginning with the combinations that constitute the parts of the head, he should form all the members in a definite order until a figure emerges. Thank you. So there's lots of kind of like practical, there really are practical recipes, like you know, man making. You know, how do you do it? Um, and it just it becomes uh, something that's uh, especially in Mary Central Cousins. Europe. Sorry? Robin, right, right. Now I want to um, go on to two more texts, 10 and 11, um, from the 17th century. And the first is Jewish and the second is not Jewish. Um, the, um, the 17th century, uh, the first one, number 10, comes from uh, a man called Zalman Svi of a place in Germany, I don't know, called Alfenhausen. Um, and it's a letter that he uh, writes to somebody else reporting on various events that have been going on in his area. And um, he tells the story in this, in this letter, which I have a bit that I haven't quoted, um, about um, someone who has a common story in Jewish history, the Jew who went over to the Christians and started bad-mouthing the Jews, right? saying all sorts of terrible things that the Jews had done. And apparently, among uh, uh, other things, this bad-mouther, according to Zalman Tzvi, talked about the Jews making men. Okay, got it? Now, so let's see uh, this the part of the letter that I bring here. Uh, you'll see why it's relevant. Somebody to read, number 10. The renegade said that there are those among the Jews who take a lump of clay, fashion it into the figure of a man, and whisper incantations and spells, whereupon the figure lives and moves. In the reply which I wrote for the Christians... For the Christians means to the Christians, like the response to the Christians. I made the turncoat look ridiculous, for I said there that he himself must be fashioned from just such kneaded lumps of clay and loam, without any sense or intelligence, and that his father must have been just such a wonder worker, for as he writes, we call such image a homer, homer, golem. homer golem, an unshaped raw mass of material, which may be rendered a monstrous ass, Right, what's the pun? Chomer and Chomer, right? Chomer and Chomer, okay? So, you know, I gave it to him. Which I say is a perfect description of him. I myself have never seen such a performance, but some of the Talmudic sages possess this, the power to do this by means of the Sefer Yitzira. We German Jews have lost this mystical tradition, but in Palestine there are still to be found some men who can perform great wonders through the Kabbalah. Our fools, another pun on the word golem, are not created out of clay, but come from their mother's wombs. It's such an interesting piece, because here is this man who's kind of a, an early 17th century, almost a muscular, and almost a, uh, you know, on the, on the verge of the early uh, Haskalah. Right, a rationalist, a real rationalist. And when he hears that this guy who's gone over to the Christians claims that the Jews make men. He pours scorn on it. How, what an idiot. How could he possibly think it? How could he possibly say it? But on the other hand, <laughs> in the Talmudic period, <coughs> they could do it. Yeah. And in our time, 
in Palestine. It's fine. Yeah. It's external, they can do it. I tell you, to me, it's so interesting. It's like this is the border of rationalism, it seems, at this moment, right? You know, what an idiot. How can you possibly think that? How can you possibly claim it? Only idiots would make claims like that. However, then, yes, and there, now, right? It's just so interesting. Yeah. Like, you understand what I'm saying? It's like, uh, it, it's fascinating. Anyway, so this is the situation. This is the belief of a Jewish rationalist in Germany in early, the early 17th century. And, um, and the next piece is a... Um, is I it? just think there was a difference. Oh, uh, many times with, the, with these arguments with the going, like that you say to them one thing, one thing. Just you really them, believe but the real truth is this. Right. 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 Absolutely. This is a Hebrew letter which was written, uh, which was written uh, like internally, right, from Jew to Jew. Um, and, but he says, you know, but, but, but even in this internal letter he's saying, you know, how on earth can anyone think something like that on, that, on the other hand, yes. Yes. Right. Like so, that's also the Gemara, like sometimes when there's, uh, there are like, these arguments, and that's what the Torah thing is. That's right, that's right. That's right. The, 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 the next piece, the 11th, is, uh, I just want to give a little bit of an introduction to. Um, in, the, uh, in the late 17th century and into the 18th century, and into the, even more into the 19th century, we get kind of what we might call a new professional developing in, uh, in Germany, um, which is what we would call today a folk anthropologist. Right? I don't know what they called it then, but it would be called today a folk anthropologist, meaning someone who goes and collects stories from a specific group of people and writes them down. Right? The, the late 18th century, early 19th century example is the Brothers Grimm. All of those stories that the Brothers Grimm put together, we you know Grimm's fairy tales, right? they were stories, they were indeed folk stories that these two folk anthropologists went, collected, and uh, in Germany, and then uh, wrote down. Uh, but they weren't the first. Um, and uh, among other things, in, people including the Brothers Grimm went and collected stories among the Jews. Um, the Brothers Grimm collect a Gollum story. They collect a Gollum story. It didn't make it into the famous big book of fairy tales, but they, created, they collected a Gollum story. But I brought in one which is fuller um, from uh, around a century uh, earlier by a, um, basically a philologist, a man called uh, Christopher Arnold, we don't know a lot about him, but he was a, uh, a, a philologist, wrote um, uh, dictionaries or uh, an, uh, uh, grammatical uh, analyses, and, um, and among other things, he also went among the Jews of Germany and collected their stories. And this is his version of, this is what he wrote down, which he heard from the Jews of Germany uh, 50, 60 years after Zalman's fee in the previous letter. Mm. In the previous letter. Number 11. After saying certain prayers and holding certain fast days, they make a figure of a man from clay. And when they have said the Shema Meforash, the actual name of God, over it, the image comes to life. And although the image itself cannot speak... Just hold on one second. Back again. Speak. Right? Back again. Right? The non-speech was there. It fell out, or in our text, it fell out, and here it is, uh, back again in the later. It understands what is said to it and commands it. Among the Polish Jews, it does all kinds of housework, but it is not allowed to leave the house. Ah, housework, right? <laughs> housework. Okay. Polish is what I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> On the part of the image, they write a myth that is truth. That an image of this kind grows each day, though very small at precedence, by becoming larger than all these in the house. In order to take away his strength, which ultimately becomes a threat to all those in the house, they quickly erase the first letter added from the word emet on his forehead, so that there remains only the word met that is dead. When this is done, the golem collapses and dissolves into the clay or mud that he was. They say that a Baal Shem, a popular healer, etc., in Poland, by the name of Rabbi Elias, made a golem who became so large that the rabbi could no longer reach his forehead to erase the letter E I. He thought up a trick, namely that the golem, being his servant, should remove his boots, supposing that when the golem bent over, he would erase the letters. And so it happened. But when the golem became mad again, his whole weight fell on the rabbi who was sitting on the bench and crushed him. Okay, so, you know, like, my goodness. The, so, so, that's the, so that's the version which is circulating, at least among the Jews that Christoph Arnold collects his story from in the late 17th century. Now, um, 
I, what I haven't brought is there are a number of other uh, Gollum stories. There are a number of people who, um, who are claimed to be, have made a Gollum. Uh, in, uh, the Vilna Gollum is claimed to have made a Gollum. The Chaim of Elogin is, meant to, is said to have created a Gollum. There are a number of stories about people who created Gollums. All of this, all of this, is by the early part of the 19th century. Everything we've done so far is by the early 19th century. We've taken things from the Talmudic period, uh, the Middle Ages, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the 17th century, we've taken all sorts of things. All of those ingredients are Gollum ingredients. The one thing we haven't put in, or one major thing we haven't put in, is Prague. Okay? Yeah, sure. Because the first mention of Prague is in the story collected in Prague in the, uh, in the mid 19th century, which we started with, which you won't read again. But I'll ask you to turn to, to number 12, which is the, the first thing that you read, the story, as it existed in the mid 19th century, and just look quickly for yourselves how many of the elements that have been mentioned are there um, now connected with the Prague uh, story. Are the elements known? But he did the work in the house, is the only thing that I really see that sticks out. That we've, we've talked about? Yeah, we talked about it. Okay. No danger then? Oh. No danger? Not the gods being dangerous? What, not about, nothing about the god's name? Shem. Well, he says his mouth, not in his head. Yeah, right, I understand. Once again, remember, elements go in and out. Elements go in and out. So here it's not Emet, which we've already met twice, by the way. Remember, we met in the Jeremiah story and then in the... Uh, in the late 17th century uh, uh, version. Um, this isn't, this is uh, a, a name which is put in his uh, mouth. Well, he's doing housework, the first time he counted housework was in the 17th century version. Um, uh, we, uh, um, we, the Kabbalah is here, uh, Sefer Yitzhila isn't here, um, all sorts of things, elements that we've looked at so far are here. But remember, the story is still evolving. In other words, just because it's now written down, it does one thing and it doesn't do another thing. What it doesn't do is stop the development. What it does do is from this time, by chance or not by chance, it nails the story to Prague. From now on, from now on, from the mid-19th century, just about every Golem development will talk about the Golem from Prague. Okay. which was created by the Maral. Maral hasn't come into anything yet, despite the fact that he commented on somebody on Rabba's story, right? Do you remember that? Yeah. But the Maral himself hasn't got no Maral Gollum story until now. From now on, just about every Gollum story, as the story continues to develop, will be connected with the Maral and connected with Prague. And uh, we're going to go, uh, aware of the time, let's put one more, which is the most important one. In the early 20th century, in 1908, a book is published by a man called Rav, called Yudel Rosenberg, in uh, Eastern Europe. I don't remember what, which town. Um, and it's, it's a book of golems, a book of stories of the golem of Prague. <coughs> it's the first book. And it's the first developed story. Up to this time, there hasn't been very much else going past the, uh, the Dr. Wiesel story from Prague. More or less, there have been a couple of other bits and pieces, but it's basically been, uh, uh, been that. And suddenly, in 1908, uh, the, the Rabbi Yul Rosenberg publishes a book, um, which he says is based on a manuscript, familiar story, that was given to him, uh, was passed down, and he, all he's doing is publishing it. Right? All he's doing is publishing it. And, but it's a whole long manuscript, it, it's a book of a couple of hundred pages, all sorts of stories about the Golem of Prague. We're just going to read the creation of the Golem uh, story, which is, uh, it's not the very first, but it's one of the first of the stories um, in the book. 
and, and we're going to we'll go straight through it. And once again, as we do it, I want you to think the elements we've already seen appear in the different places, uh, which of them are in, which of them are out, etc., etc. So somebody is somebody prepared to start. Perhaps we'll divide it into two, so someone reads the first part and somebody else. How Rabbi Lowe created the Golden. Unless someone's going to read. Sure. created a dream quest, directed a dream quest to determine how to wage war against the priest, his antagonist. And the answer came out alphabetically in Hebrew. Ah, by clay, destroy evil, forces, golem, help Israel, justice. I don't know, I only know the English version. Yes. The, originals in, the originals in Yiddish. And, um, and just, it's a great translation. Um, and I should have said that before this, um, the first part, I said this is near the beginning of the book, but it's not the first part. The first part is about the wicked priest who is uh, encouraging his, uh, uh, his flock in Prague to uh, attack the Jews, etc., etc., etc. There's a crisis, and that's the background to the dream question that Rabbi Lowe uh, directs. The rabbi said that the ten words form such a combination that it had the power to create a golem at any time. He then revealed the secret to me, his son-in-law, Isaac ben Samson Cohen, and to his foremost pupil, Jacob ben Chaim Sasson Halevi. It was the secret of what he had to do, and he told us he would need our help because I was born under the sign of fire, and the pupil, Yaakov ben Chaim Sasson Halevi, was born under the sign of water, and Rabbi Lowe himself was born under the sign of air, and the creation of Golan would require all four elements, fire, air, water, and earth. He also told us to keep the matter secret and informed us seven days ahead of time how to behave, act. In the Jewish year, 5340, in the month of Adar, corresponding to February 1580 in the Christian calendar, all three of us walked out of the city early one morning until we reached the shores of the Moldau River. There on a clay bank, we measured out a man, three cubits long, and we drew his face in the earth, and his arms and his legs, and the way a man lies on his back. Then all three of us stood at the feet of the reclining golem, with our faces to his face, and the rabbi commanded me to circle the golem seven times from the right side of the head. To the head. To the head, excuse me. From the head to the left side, and then back to the feet. And he told me the formula to speak as I circled the golem seven times. And when I had done the rabbi's bidding, the golem turned as red as fire. Next, the rabbi commanded his pupil Yaakov Sasson to do the same as I had done, but he revealed a different formula to him. This time, the fiery redness was extinguished, and a vapor arose from the reclining figure, which had grown nails and hair. Now the rabbi walked around the golem seven times with the Torah scrolls, like the circular procession in synagogue at Simchat Torah. And then in conclusion, all three of us together recited the verse. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of fire. The breath of life. life. The breath of life, sorry. And the man became a living soul. Okay. So once again, so hold on, we'll just before we continue. Um, so once again, we've got back to that original creation uh, uh, verse. Um, and now let's see. Uh, and now let's see what happens as the breath, as the uh, as the verse is breathed um, into his uh, uh, into this uh, figure. Um, somebody else to continue? And now the woman opened his eyes and peered at us in amazement. Rabbi Lo shouted in Hebrew, "Stand on your feet!" The golem stood up, and we dressed him in the garments that we had brought along, the clothes befitting a shamash in a rabbinical household. And at six o'clock in the morning, we started home, four men. On the way, Rabbi Lo said to the Golem, you have to know that we created you so that you would protect the Jews from harm. Your name is Joseph, and you will be my leader. I just want to say once again, now, the first okay. version of defending. Golem defends. Now it's not Golem doing the housework, okay? Now it's Golem defending from this 1908 version. You must do everything I command, even if it means jumping into fire or water until you've carried out my orders precisely. The golem was unable to speak, but he could hear very well, even from far away. The rabbi then told us he had named the golem Joseph because he had given him the spirit of Yosef Shaddai, who was half man and half demon, and who had helped the Talmudic sages in times of great trouble. 
Back home, the rabbi told the household in regard to the golem that he had met a mute pauper in the street, a great simpleton, and that he had felt sorry for him and taken him home to help out the synagogue officials. But the rabbi strictly forbade anyone else from ever giving him any orders. The golem always sat in a corner of the rabbi's courtroom with his hands folded behind his head, just like a golem, who thinks about nothing at all, and so people started calling him Yosef the Golem, and a few nicknamed him Yosef the Mute. And, that, and if you want more, you have to go to the uh, to the story. You can find the story. You can find the book. It sounds like a description of Lurch in the Evans family. <laughs> absolutely. Right. Right. Absolutely. 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 Absolutely.
And then we go on to the next story. We go on to the next story. We go on to the next story. And there's so many, I'm not going to make the claim for absolutely every story, but so many of the folk stories have indeed these extraordinary histories of you know, incredible Gilgulim, as slowly the different elements appear, disappear, reappear, and uh, finally they find some kind of a, I wouldn't say final form, but at least a more crystallized form. Um, two things. First of all, there's a lot of children's picture books yeah. on the dwelling that came out when I was working with the kids in that. It is, now I have to go back and reread them and see the difference. Yeah, see what Thank you. Yeah. Um, but I thought the Rosenberg story was actually very, very different from the others and it obviates the problem of the theological issue because there's three separate men who each have a specific oh. task and it can't be done by one. Yeah. And therefore, it's not a theological question. Man cannot create man because they all they, they they need God in mm -hmm. there. And there is no paper, and there is no shame. Absolutely. So this golem is not turn offable in the same way, but this golem answers only to one of them. Correct. And no one else is allowed to give orders to this golem. So it's, it's a very different story. Except than that, others. correct, correct, full stop. Right? And once again, and you know, I repeat what I've said, it's, there's no linear development in these things. There's kind of, yeah, you know, sure. but, the, but the end of the story, the end of Yudel Rosenberg's story, which is not this story, this is one, remember, this is one early chapter of the book, the, the whole book goes to the physical danger of, you know, and the collapse and the this, that, the other, and Shabbat. So that's where it goes. So the, um, so, um, the, the last point I wanted to, you wanted to say something, you know, make the last point. The part that got to me was where they're quoting and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground mm. and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Mm. Like no words are needed. Absolutely. I want to say to that half a word, which is uh, I, the word that keeps on coming to my mind is clone, that they tried to clone on the machine, but maybe what's the, what the point of this, isn't it? Um, I think that even when we're talking about um, men being creators and everything. I, I sometimes see um, parents when they, you know, they first have kids and everything. It's like, okay, we've created this child, and you know, we're just, you know, we're, we're godlike. But as we all know, this is not the case. And it's very, very dangerous with clones. We have to be very careful um, not to create clones of any kind. So I, I think the clone is just like, you know, well, so far, the last. Uh, the most final um, uh, step in this whole question of people claiming to be creators. Absolutely. I totally think that. I just want to add two details. And I remember one of the interesting things about the Yudel Rosenberg uh, stories, Yudel Rosenberg, I mentioned, was a rabbi. And the only other things he ever re wrote were like commentaries or rabbinic works. This is the only thing that is not in character. And to his dying day, he swore that someone gave him this manuscript. However, it has to be said that. Um, until the doctor, as far as the state of knowledge today, until the uh, 19, mid 19th century connection right, with the story of Dr. Wiesel, which pins the golem on, places it in Prague, until then, there is no known, at this point in knowledge, connection between, um, between uh, Prague, uh, the Maharal, and the golem. And for example, if, if you know, scholars who've looked at the some of the introductions uh, to um, uh, the Maharal's, some of the Maharal's books, which were written by his grandchildren. Um, and they bring all the traditions that are connected with their grandfather in order to kind of look at Eric or even to say, a one book, um, he was, he was no longer alive, and there's no, there's no hint of anything. There's no hint. So it does appear at our current, current state of knowledge that, the, that somehow, we don't know how, we don't know how it appeared among the Jews of Prague. And I'm not saying that when Dr. Wiesel picked it up in the mid-19th century, it was only invented then. We only hear of it then, and we don't hear of it uh, uh, beforehand. But from that time on, it becomes. So, you know what? So, Jürgen Rosenberg, is it, is it you, know, you know, what was he doing there? He swore to his dying day. It was a, literally a manuscript that he got, that he believed was genuine, etc., etc. The very last thing I'm going to say was Frankenstein. So absolutely, so Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein, spent <coughs> a lot of time in Germany. And uh, there are many scholars who believe that she picked up the Golem story, which, as we've already seen with, Chris, with Christoph Arnold and the Brothers Grimm, was known by the 19th century, was known in Germany. Right? Forget the Jews. The story of the, 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 the making of the man who goes out of control 
uh, the artificially created man, that was already known in Germany. So many scholars uh, believe indeed that that was her inspiration and then she, she did what she did and she created uh, the book that she created. This idea of protecting the Jews, mm -hmm. that seems to be a very late addition. Mm -hmm. Was that taken from politics of the day? There was a I don't think that, you know what, I mean, there's, this will take, we're not going to go into a whole other direction, but I would, I would say that some of you will have, um, uh, those of you who read Cavalier and Clay, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and know the story about, you know, so, so many of the, um, the creation of, the creators of superheroes in the 20th century, in fact, were Jews. And I would say that very much there's a kind of a, um, a wannabe um, factor here. That people, when they were at their, uh, you know, when their um, communities were their most desperate and the most vulnerable, they created out of wishful thinking these fantasy stories um, in order to, you know, make them feel that power was ultimately on their side. Uh, and that's that's the context which I would suggest. There might be other contexts as well. As we're going to finish, uh, thank you very much. And thank you. By the way, by the way, what the charity of the week? Thank you. Thank you. I've got the money that we're collecting for Lette. Thank you again, Robin. Thank you, Yona. And of course, thank you, Steve. I could just carry on listening to you for hours and hours.